On the bench today is a Commodore Amiga 500 home computer. It looks pretty good, it smells pretty good, and it's on my bench, so of course, it doesn't boot. Let's dig in. For those who haven't seen one of these before, the Amiga 500 was the first real Commodore-led Amiga. The Amiga 1000 was released in mid-1985, and Commodore decided to create two classes of Amiga from that machine, and released the 500 and the 2000 in January of 1987. Now the 500 did the majority of what the 1000 did in a compact design reminiscent of the 128. It had the same Motorola 68000 at 7-ish megahertz, the same 512K of RAM, the exact same excellent graphics and sound. Now it lacked the slots of the 2000 or the expansion door of the 1000, but it had its own sidecar expansion port and a good selection of ports on the back to add accessories. It was an incredibly well-rounded multimedia machine for a pretty reasonable price, around $700 USD. It was a lot of money for 1987 but great compared to the $1,300 launch price of the 1000, or $2,600 for a Macintosh Plus. Now, Commodore wasn't entirely sure how to market these, particularly in the US, but the 500 sold extremely well. Exact numbers aren't really clear, because Commodore sales numbers weren't always on the up and up, but it was definitely in the millions. Now look at this giant Amiga on the desk. This takes up the entire space I have for this frame. So now in the whole scheme of things, this Amiga 500 is in pretty decent condition. No major scuffs or marks, and obviously there's some yellowing that's happened over time on the case and keys. But the keys are pretty good, they feel good. Uh, the keyboard feels great, good spring response, all the springs are in place. We have a floppy drive. The sidecar cover is missing, which means, obviously, we're going to need to plug a sidecar into this thing. First thing though, we're going to need this thing to boot. Well, even the bottom looks okay. We got some minor scratching on the left here, but not bad for a mid-1980s machine. Opening up the trap door, we find... So we have a RAM and clock card. I'm seeing Sanyo 242256s. So a 16-bit machine, maybe these are... 256 by fours, so an additional 512k of RAM. This is a nice surprise. Now the nice thing about this though is that it has a CR2032, which means it's far less likely to leak than one of the Commodore trapdoor solutions. That said, it is absolutely soldered down, so it's going to require some work, but I don't think we're cleaning up leakage, which... hooray. Let's get moving though. Remember, Attempt to repair voids the warranty. So to open the Amiga, there are three screws up here. And down here, there are three additional screws. These look to be Torx bits. Commodore at this time, every Amiga was different. I think it was whatever they could source at the time. So some of them are Torx and some of them are Phillips head. All right, with these screws removed, the cover pops right off. Okay, no major damage, I, no rust, at least that I can see. Uh, there's some stuff down at the bottom here, so probably a spill at some point. With the keyboard up on top, looks like it's in pretty good condition. Nothing crazy here, which is good. We're going to unplug the header over here, try not to damage it, very gently pull it away. Then we have that ground there, which is held on by this screw over here. First visual inspection. We have a hack here from these two pins. Not knowing enough about the Amiga 500, I'm probably going to have to look that up. We have a floppy cable that was slightly loose. Maybe that could cause a no-boot? I don't know for sure. 
One interesting thing though here, there are two resistors that are burnt, like seriously burnt, and that's going to cause a problem. So that's going to have to be replaced no matter what. Otherwise, we have intact chips, floppy connector loose. Chips are secure but a little crispy. Everything seems to be in place. All the RAM is filled. Is that a Rockwell 68000? That's kind of cool. Denise looks okay. Yeah, so these two resistors are going to be a problem. I'm going to have to take a look at the schematic to see what they're connected to. I mean, obviously that's going to be a problem at some point, uh, but we'll have to see what to do. Let's do some lookups and uh, decide where to go from here. I've decided to reseat some chips because everything seems crunchy. We're going to start with Paula. These are really tough. I think there was some humidity around here because everything is super crunchy. Denise. Our first CIA. Get some cabling out of the way. Let me pull the second CIA. And Gary. That was tough. I'm kind of wondering if that was our problem. And put a little deoxid on so that doesn't happen again. Pull out the ROM. I'm going to pop a Diag ROM in so that we can actually do some diagnostics or see this thing boot into something just in case it's not this. And then Fad Agnes, which is a PLCC. Uh, make sure you use a PLCC puller, uh, otherwise, you're underneath with a pick, and that sucks. I think we're ready to power up. Diagram comes right up. No issues with the ROM. Okay. Our ROM checksum is good. All the devices pop up. So do an IRQ test. I try to run through as many of these as possible. It's not a surefire if diagram works, the Amiga is going to work. But it's a good start. CIAs are okay, so I don't have to use my literal only spare. Do a memory test. I'll fast forward through this a little bit. So while this looks bad, it just means we've hit the last of our 512k of chip RAM. So this actually looks good. We can pull out the diagram and put our real ROM back. Yes! I haven't tested it yet, but given the crunchiness of the chips, I'm guessing the floppy mechanism is in the same condition. So we're going to disassemble, clean this thing. The Amiga 500 is this nice little metal casing around a standard looking floppy here. So we'll check out this mechanism, see how smooth it is, go from there. It actually looks really good, like there's nothing wrong with this at all. At least no obvious signs of damage, which is great.
So with all the dust out, let's go ahead and do the bare minimum here. So we'll clean the heads. Remember not to move the mechanism too much. I'm just using a Q-tip here with some isopropyl alcohol. Yeah, this looks fine. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put this back together. Somehow a simple metal case always seems needlessly complicated. Come on. Go in. We have a floppy. Perfect. Before buttoning this up, I wanted to get those two resistors replaced that were scorched on the motherboard. I'm doing this as a voiceover afterwards because this was incredibly loud. Uh, I forgot to use headphones when working on this project. Now desoldering and resoldering components is honestly my favorite part of this whole process. And part of that is because you kind of get into this Zen state where there's just things you got to do. You got to take your time. You have to be confident. And I psych myself out waiting for the very end to do it. But as long as you spend time, it's perfect. And as you can see here, I don't have a fancy desoldering pump. Uh, this is actually just an electric one from Amazon. As you can tell from the smoke, the heat gets a little high, so you have to be very careful about using this. But honestly, it works pretty well. It cleans up super nice. Thank you, Commodore, for laying out this board in a somewhat sane way so that I'm not melting things nearby. It's kind of nice. We just have a little heat on top to help remove the component. They're nice and scorched. A nice new one goes back in its place and really easy to tamp down. Board looks good as new. Really happy with how these turn out. They stand out a little bit compared to, you know, 30 year old components. But all in all, not bad. And with the resistors in place, we can power this up again and make sure that it works. In the background, I gave the case a little bit of a wash. Everything over here is cleaned up now. Even down here, all the stains are now completely done. It's nice and clean, nice and dry. I think we're ready to put some stuff back in here. Fiddly little plastic clips. So we're just gonna have to be super careful. Come on, slide in. Come on. Yeah. Get the bottom of the floppy secure. More fiddly bits.
Before we start wrapping up putting this together, I want to replace this battery. I mentioned before how nice it was that this was a 2032, but it's soldered into the carrier, which isn't that helpful. Instead, I bought a nice battery carrier that lets me replace this battery down the road, and it fits in with the same pin layout as the existing carrier, so it's nothing special here. Desolder the existing one, replace with the new one, pop in a battery. So I turned this on and forgot to record. So I'm actually gonna show this again because I wanna show how ridiculous this is. So if we select the keyboard test here, check it out. Works great, right? Any modifier key. Nothing. Control Amiga Amiga. No, nothing. Now we get to do a keyboard. So we'll gingerly pull off the top of this keyboard. Oh, that sounds terrible. But at least it comes off cleanly. So the plungers are definitely working. Let's try these modifier keys. Yeah, that seems to be fine. Okay. Well. Ugh. Okay, that's pretty bad. So these connections, there's little bits of dirt and crud here, but look over here. Like somebody spilled something a long time ago and it dried down here. That's probably not the source of the problem, but we could probably get it cleaned up. Uh, looks like it comes out here. So let's carefully see if we can pull this out. I'm not sure how, oh, right, retaining clip. little stuck but okay so let's slowly pull that out we'll put that aside and get that cleaned up while we're down here I'll go ahead and clean this off a little bit of isopropyl alcohol on a cotton pad you. So funny story, the recording equipment I used, the SD card decided to eat itself and I lost a bunch of footage before I had transferred it over to my computer. So unfortunately all the parts where I cleaned off the keyboard, removed the keys, cleaned those up, reassembled the keyboard, reassembled the computer, are all lost to the sands of time, which kind of sucks. But here's the machine. The keyboard works. It's nicely cleaned up. Each part of the case was actually washed off and came out pretty well. If we flip it around, flipping it around, it actually kind of looks the same, to be honest. Time I have. Reinstalled our trapdoor expansion card with an additional 512k of RAM, as well as the RTC clock battery. So at this point, best course of action, go ahead and power this thing up.
Okay, everyone has seen Workbench. Let's make this Amiga be what it was great at, and play something. This is Tunnels of Armageddon. I played this a bunch on my PC when I was younger, and it's just as great or better on an Amiga. Amiga DOS. And what's cool is you can play this with a mouse, you don't need a joystick or anything. Oh right, copy protection. Okay. That's out of the way. Let's fly. So many controls on the screen for only one thing you have to do. Ah. I think this is how anyone should learn how to use a mouse for the first time. Ugh. Amazing. I feel like I hit the same places now as I did when I was a kid. So we're going to shoot these little diamond things, and then follow the tunnels, and eventually we get to the end, and yeah, see, I keep hitting the same spots. I loved the green effect when I was a kid. The colors just always seem so rich. Alright, I beat the level. So there we have it, a working Amiga 500. We have a working keyboard, memory expansion, floppy drive, the audio works, the video works. Not a problem with this thing at all. In a future episode, we'll take a look at some of the other expansion hardware that I got around the same time and see if we can get this thing built up a little bit without using any modern hardware. Until next time, Thanks for watching.